as those of you who watched part one will know, envelope viruses, those with lipid bilayer membranes, acquire their membrane by budding out through the surface or into an internal compartment of the host cell. And likewise, they penetrate cells that they are about to infect by fusion, a reverse of the budding process, by fusion of viral and cellular membranes. Different viruses have different triggers, or sensors if you wish, to initiate the fusion process. Influenza virus, which enters through endosomes, depends on the low pH of the endosome to initiate fusion. Viruses such as HIV can fuse at the cell surface, and they depend on sensing the receptor, which triggers conformational changes of its own, and in the case of HIV, a co-receptor as well. What is membrane fusion? Membrane fusion is, in the simplest sense, making one bilayer out of two. But it's a relatively complicated process in practice, although it's thermodynamically downhill, that is, the fused structure is ultimately stabler than the two separate structures, but there's a substantial kinetic barrier, and it's overcoming that kinetic barrier that is the role of the viral fusion proteins or of cellular fusion proteins. So a, an intermediate in the fusion process is generally accepted to be a structure in which the opposed monolayers, the opposed leaflets of the two bilayers have merged, but not yet the distal ones. And that's called a hemifusion structure or a hemifusion stalk. And while there are still some debates about the detailed organization of the hemifusion intermediate, it's clear from a number of studies that that is an important step en route to fusion. Indeed, the barrier between two bilayers and the hemifusion structure is one of the major kinetic barriers in this process of fusion. And there is probably a kinetic barrier between hemifusion and the ultimate merging of the distal leaflets that lead to the formation of a fusion pore. In the case of viral proteins, there's a sequence of events that's reasonably stereotypical, it turns out, even though the machinery, the molecular machinery driving this series of events may look very different. That is, the fusion proteins of different viruses, although from the point of view of their protein architecture, may be very different. The underlying process that they catalyze, and there is a real sense in which this is a catalysis, since as I said, it's thermodynamically downhill, but with a high kinetic barrier. The sequence of events that they catalyze is reasonably um, uh, stereotypical in all cases. And so uh, uh, before events begin, the fusion protein is in some conformation, and this is a purely schematic representation, and there are two bilayers. The bilayer of the membrane in the cell, and the bilayer in the membrane of the virus, and the bilayer of the membrane of the cell to which the virus is attached. Some event, proton binding or receptor binding, induces or fixes a conformational change in the protein, in the fusion protein, that leads to the formation of an extended intermediate in which a hydrophobic element, either an N-terminal peptide or a loop in the middle of an extended part of the protein structure, interacts with the target cell membrane. And that extended intermediate, which is transient, then collapses into a structure that is ultimately a stable structure for the fusion protein and drags the two membranes together. As I suggested, there are probably kinetic barriers from the point of view of the lipid bilayer itself, both between the two bilayer state 
and the hemifusion state and between the hemifusion state and the final formation of a fusion pore. And it is the role of the fusion protein to lower that kinetic barrier as suggested by these dashed red lines.